Good evening, welcome to Born Environmental Review. It's July 13th, 2015. I'm hoping uh, everybody out there is enjoying the summer uh, as much as I am. The great, wonderful warm weather we're having. I will not complain at all about humidity, as I'm sure uh, nobody in Cape will because of the winter we had. We were all begging for warm weather. So I'm sure you're in the same boat as I am, where I'll be glad to take all the humidity if I uh, don't have to put up with some of the the blizzards that we endured. Uh, my guest tonight is a part two of a show that I did uh, recently. Uh, and we had so much fun and there's so much to talk about that we couldn't get through everything. We have a long list of stuff to talk about. And it really builds on the themes that we were discussing last show about organic living and really bringing more down to what you can do and how uh, your, what your role is in all of this we were talking about bigger issues last time. Uh, this time we wanted to focus a little bit more on things that you can do, how your lifestyle affects what the environment is around you and vice versa. We're all connected. So uh, I wanted to introduce my guest again is Laura Kelly. Laura, how Hello. are you? Thanks for uh, having me. From East Ham and uh, of uh, Littlefield Landscapes, among other things. Uh, Laura, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? It's an organization you founded on Cape as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Great. Yeah, I'm Laura Kelly. I was born and raised uh, north side East Dennis and uh, bought a house in East Ham 15 years ago. I've been an organic land care provider for 23 years. And I've also created an organization called POCA, Protect Our Cape Cod Aquifer. So it's pocacapecod.org, an organization where we're educating people, um, homeowners, businesses, um, you know, on up to, you know, the selectmen, to senators, so kind of the towns, people to the state, you know, what's going on in our own backyards and what can we do about it if, you know, we don't want it to happen, you know. Aquifer bridges. being groundwater. Being For right. those of you who don't know what that is, and because we're heavily dependent on groundwater in the Cape, pretty much. It's our greatest natural resource here. And it's all sand, so everything we put on the ground seeps down into there. And if, okay. It's really something that, it's, it's actually a relatively new science. It wasn't that long ago that they didn't even know what a plume was. 35 years ago, 40 years ago, they started figuring this out, that what we put on our ground eventually goes somewhere. Sure, gravity. Right. Gravity happens. <laughs> so, what are we what are we talking about? What are the types of things that uh, might end up where we don't want them to be? Well, anything that we consume is the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. So, anything we purchase, uh, we put on our bodies, we put in our bodies, we put in our homes, we put on our land. It's all going to go south. <laughs> it's all going to get into our aquifer sooner or later. <clears throat> And it's really up to us to uh, make wise choices. And I think we have a greater responsibility living here on Cape Cod than inland. And so um, I brought lots of fun things to talk about. And right, giving there's examples, a, lot of, so. a lot of awesome stuff you got here and we're gonna have you make a little, little uh, mixture for us. Um, and this is something that uh, I think we've talked about on this show a lot about how we're connected to our water also the groundwater, but also everything eventually drains to the oceans. So all the storm drains, all the runoff, rivers, they all end up in the ocean and the oceans aren't a little distinct. There's no wall between the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indian. I mean, it all starts to mix and go around and around and around in one big giant yeah. ocean, really. So it never goes away. No, it's, uh, I think it's time to connect the dots. You know, basically, there is a, an action, a reaction for our actions. And we've got to be a little bit more responsible for our actions. Um, and that way, it'll keep our natural resources longer for more generations. You know, that includes food. I mean, we're really reliant on, you know, the food around here, the oysters, the lobsters, you know, the right. fish, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of the economy. Absolutely. So the sooner we can use less uh, 
and be dependent less on chemicals, uh, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, you know, man-made things. And I just believe that there's a natural remedy for absolutely everything out there. You have to see what works for your situation and maybe do a little trial and error, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I really think that there's always going to be an answer, you know, that's successful. You know, it takes a little effort, maybe rethinking. I, I, this reminds me of a story. We talked about it a few years back when you were on the show. Uh, I went to a lecture at my alma mater, Babson. They had an environmental expo. And um, Gary, I can't remember his name, Hirschfeld, I think his name is, is the owner, uh, uh, founder of Stonyfield Yogurt, which happens to be a very good Yogurt, excellent stuff. Vanilla, I can't find vanilla. I like the banana vanilla. <laughs> and he talked about how he has to think through his entire supply chain. And, and part of that, a big one, was sugar. Mm -hmm. And where do you get your sugar from? A lot of it, he was getting sugar cane from Brazil. And they did what they do around the world, which is they would burn huge swathes of uh, sugar cane to get to the, to the stock. You know, sure. And they'd burn all the rest of it, which is now dumping huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. Right. And to get then, um, then the soils would be depleted and they would have to add fertilizer. In the meantime, there's nothing protecting the soil, so there starts to be erosion and that gets run off into the streams. And then he said, let's think about this again. Let's try this another way. Let's, let's mow down what we, don't, what we were burning before and the silage, the waste products, if you will, quote unquote, put it on the fields well, then that fertilized the fields, and the carbon was recycled back locally instead of being dumped into the atmosphere. Yes. Didn't need the fertilizer. It created little pockets for little rodents and wildlife and mammals to run around and develop, and then that drew raptors in, and which, you know, on and on, I'm sure sure. you can know the whole cycle of life there. And so the fertilizer use went down. Um, they didn't have to deal with the runoff issues. Didn't have to... Uh, emit huge amounts of carbon and the risks of fires and all that. So it was a kind of interesting story. Now, it was just a shift in thinking mm -hmm. and a shift in way of better planning and adapting what they were doing. This is probably, uh, it, was, it was just, well, that's the way we've always done it. They made an assumption. Right. Okay. And I think, uh, do you see that more and more with uh, local farmers in the Cape that turn it? Kind of I shedding that, what was their parents were told in the 50s after World War II, you know, the petrochemical, you know, better living through chemicals, going back to what their ancestors did. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of times a simpler way of doing things that ends up being cost effective in the end. Somewhere along the line, we were told, you know, we need to use a chemical in order to grow food. And that's just another product. You know, that's just another something to pay for. Um, when 100 years ago, we, no, we, nobody grew food that way, you know, so in order to go back, you know, 50, 100 years and have that way of thinking is the mentality we need to go back to because I really think that the direction we're headed in right now is unsustainable and we've got to make some serious changes and it really starts at home with each individual person simply by where your dollar goes like what you spend your money on is going to make a really big difference in the long run and in, in nature you know um, so one thing going on now with harvesting um, you know big you know fields uh, of food they're they're actually spraying the food down with herbicides with Roundup in order to kill the food in order to harvest it. Uh, they do this three days prior. That's a weird kind. Explain <laughs> that. What do you mean by that? To kill the food to harvest it. He, he, yeah, it's, it makes it's it easier um, on the machinery. It's easier to harvest when it's dead than when it's alive. So um, this is something that, of course, Monsanto rec recommends um, that conventional farms spray wheat, oats, uh, canola, flax, peas, lentils, non-GMO soybeans, dry beans, and sugar cane. So you've got some sugar cane, spray it down with Roundup to kill it, and then harvest it. So a lot of times our food is it's getting another dose of Roundup before we're receiving it. So it's just a, one more 
you know, unfortunate situation where we're headed in, in our, our growing of our food source that we've got to be conscious and aware about and in order to make wise choices, they're not labeling this. <laughs> So <laughs> we've got to purchase organic, we've got to purchase locally and build our local farmers. Are there any states, I know Vermont tried, had, did they, were they successful to, to get a labeling law? So yeah, so there was a, a few states, uh, and the latest one being New York, congratulations. Um, but this will not actually uh, take an effect. Uh, three, there's, there's you know the fine print, three states uh, must um, be next to each other. So if Massachusetts did it, come on Massachusetts, then uh, let's see, Vermont, Vermont, Connecticut, and uh, New York would also be able to do okay. it, go forward with this. The problem with this whole situation is state by state they're going forward to actually want to put labels on GMO foods. Uh, unfortunately there's the Dark Act, and the Dark Act states that no state, no, <laughs> sorry, I said that twice, but no state like Vermont, uh, it would be obsolete. All this work would just be washed away. It, what does the Dark Act say? So, well, they won't tell us this is why it's called the Dark Act. So um, it's in, you know, Congress right now, it's on the floor, we're hold, holding our breath, we're on the edge of our seats wondering what's really going to happen. Um, there's, there's no text that you can read? Which it's, it's all secret. It's this so sounds like the uh, behind, TPP, the trade deal. That's it. That will let that the Dark Act is is pushing that through. That's it. That's oh, exactly it. Okay. That's the same thing. Oh, it's called the TIPP. It's called yeah. the TPP. Yeah, they, they have so many different names for it now that right. it makes a confu. They want to confuse us. It's working, but it's still the same thing. So um, they've attached a rider or something correct. in that. And that's Fast Track Authority and the Correct. Trans uh, Pacific the Partnership they're talking about, which just for the viewers, what's scary about that, and uh, this came up in a policy class I was I'm taking at UMass, um, one, of the, one of my colleagues and students there wrote about this. Um, you can't see the bill, and I've heard actually a state congressman, you have to go to a special room to even see the bill, and then you can't talk about it afterwards. Can't write anything And down. then uh, also, it allows corporations in a special court outside the United States jurisdiction to bring lawsuits against a country if it affects their business. So you could have pick whatever com company from overseas, you know, subsidiary <laughs> suing the United States because the regulation we posed in this country they didn't like or you know cost them a little bit more money, and then that would be decided by a court system a panel of some sort outside our constitutionally um, authorized court legal systems through the states and the, and the federal government. That's it's pretty scary. written for the corporations, it's written by the corporations, and it is not for the people. So it's interesting, you've got different candidates out there, and, and I'm not going to get into specific names or politics, I mean everybody sees the, the news every day, uh, but this is the sort of stuff that's been talked around for a long time. It's starting to really become even more obvious. Um, corporatization, globalization, it's really huge. Yeah. You know, it's, there's, there's no bones about it. I mean, and that's the thing that I think a lot of folks in maybe in traditional business roles would say, well, what's wrong with international trade? And nothing wrong with international trade. It's what are these ground rules you're setting up that are going to maybe affect our sovereignty, affect our local businesses. It's kind of interest, you know, interesting to say the least. Yeah. So the Dark Act, you're saying they may have slipped some stuff in there about um, the preventing labeling. Correct. Correct. They're pushing it forward as fast as they can. It's, um, it's unfortunate. And um, I really think that the more people that know about this happening, the, we've got to actually step up. We've got to reach our um, state senators, our congressmen, and tell them the way we feel about these things. Because if we don't talk now, we're just going to have to live with the consequences. And I cannot imagine, you know, what the what it's really going to be like. Um, World Trade seven years ago was totally different than it is today, and what they're proposing for the next seven years, uh, with, they're really going to, you know, give all the jobs to foreigners. I mean, I, 
it's just a shame. It's unnecessary. Well, and you get interesting things like you're finding that <clears throat> vegetables grown overseas, they're cheap for a reason. Number one, the labor's cheap, but the environmental standards are horrible. And then they're, you're, they're finding all sorts of nasty things in the food that we're importing, you know, from heavy metals mm -hmm. to all sorts of uh, um, nasty bacteria or things because they're grown in very unsanitary and giant mega farms with polluted water because then it's cheaper and it's, you know, hey, we don't have to, we're eating that. So the latest thing is chicken. Chicken is now shipped to China and processed there and shipped back to us. There's our chicken. You go out to a restaurant and you purchase, you know, chicken in a salad or chicken, you know, with mm. some rice and it doesn't say it's organic or you don't know where it's actually from, now it is allowed to go to China, be processed, and come back. That is, it's scary to me, you know? Uh, we have no idea what's going on with our value of our foods anymore. Right. Well, it's interesting. I'm wondering if there's going to be a niche for businesses that not wanting to wait for the government to act, which could take a long time, are then proactively positioning themselves to dis differentiate themselves by saying that they don't do these things. And I, one, one that comes to mind is um, Purdue, that they claim that they do everything in the United States. I don't know whether they're the ones they're sending over to processing now or not, but they claim that they're all American raised and fed with marigolds and, and the USDA checks them out and they're processed here. At least they're trying to establish that it, it isn't massive chicken processing farms overseas, that they're grown in Maryland and this is what they do. And, and whether you're a very vegetarian or not, at least, you know, it sounds like some companies and others, I'm sure we can talk about, are trying to say, well, we're not waiting for a labeling law. We're telling you what we're putting in our products and let the marketplace decide. So you can do it that way too. Sure. Right? Um, the thing uh, to look out for is, we'll take chicken, because we're about chicken. Um, what are the chickens eating? Right. And is that genetically modified corn that your chicken that you're going to eat is eaten? So it's kind of thinking about the step before, you know, um, and that's what we really need to do because uh, corn is genetically modified <laughs> right. and it is food for a lot of animals out there that we eat. And so you got to really remove yourself from the situation and, and, and take control of the ones, the ones you love. I mean, really think about what you're purchasing, where you're purchasing it. A couple of dollars extra for organic nowadays, it's well worth it because it's a lot cheaper than <laughs> getting sick. You know? So what is, where do folks in the Cape, you know, how can they get this? They're, everybody's busy, they're doing two jobs. You know, this sounds great, Laura, but you know, I, I, I gotta stop and shop and you know, whatever, it's five o'clock, I gotta run down and grab some processed food because I'm busy. Are there farms that cater to either doing some prep or you know, community support agriculture where you buy crop shares? Why don't you tell yeah. us about that? Maybe some There are a lot of CSAs available, almost I'd say in about every other town on mm -hmm. average. Uh, please do your own research and find out what's close to your um, your vicinity. Um, but there are also chain stores that are decent, and then there's chain stores that are that are not decent. Um, you know, things like Trader Joe's is definitely a step above you know Stop and Shop, and then there's you know Whole Foods, but then there's smaller markets like natural markets that are local. Um, there's one in Chatham and one in Dennis. There's one in Orleans. Mm -hmm. You know, I know there's one in Barnstable. Mashpee. One so, of Falmouth, I think it's so. Amber Waves, uh, that type of thing. And so mm -hmm. they're hidden a little bit. You know. I think it's called preparation. Yeah. You know, you can't come home at 5 o'clock and say, I want chicken at dinner at 6 o'clock tonight. Right. So what I do is I actually go to um, Phoenix Fruit and Orleans Whole Food Store and Farmer's Markets. And so those are the three places I rely on. So there's Farmer's Market in Orleans on Saturday and Wellfleet on Wednesday and Truro on Monday. So you can get lettuce throughout the week because lettuce doesn't last a whole week. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, the other things is, is to freeze stuff. I have an extra freezer. And I put fruits in there, I put meats in there. So when I come home at five o'clock, I can go to my freezer. Right. I just put, 
you know, the chicken in a bowl and of cold water and it's thawed out within 20 minutes. So I've, you know, picked some lettuce and cleaned that and, and it comes out, you know, to be done in an hour. Um, so for me, it's, I think it's called preparation. And also you don't need to eat such a large amount of food uh, if it's organic than if it's not organic. It's more nutrient dense, right? Is that why you want to say that? Yes, you're getting vitality. You're getting mm -hmm. the essence of your food. If it's organic, if it's, you know, genetically modified and been to China and back, I mean, it's really lost its sense. Well, the other, the other side of that coin is that um, one thing I look at is, and you, you get this in recycling, we talk about this, it's embedded energy to get from the point of growing it to processing it, to packaging it, to shipping it to your plate. Right. You know, the whole cycle is energy. Sure. And if it's grown here and they're shipped around the world, I mean, there's no free lunch, as Milton Friedman used to say. Um, somewhere along the way, somebody's paying. And what we're not seeing is those externalities, you know, use an economics term that, um, well, it's cheaper because they're not paying for the full cost or impacts because we're just exporting those to another country. You know, they're still using things we may not want because that's the way they keep the price down. Right. But so that just means they get polluted. Yeah. You know, that was done with electronics, you know, e-waste recycling. You know, and overseas it was cheap and there was lots of problems. So things are coming back. It's kind of interesting. I, th I think um, in a lot, of F a lot of ways things are coming back home to us and uh, have you seen that in your in your efforts uh, I know you do a local show down down uh, down Cape and, and um, well, I think um, in general we have to believe in what we cannot see um, we have to realize that there is an aquifer that there are things going on and I'm I'm an optimist mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yet there's repeats going on in history we're, history is just repeating itself, you know, from Agent Orange to glyphosate. <clears throat> glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, and it's prolific. It's used more around the world than any other herbicide. And that, to me, is history repeating itself. So on one hand, we say, happy day. People are waking up and smelling the coffee. <laughs> um, but yet, on the other hand, we're still not learning from our mistakes or you know, they've made it so hard. We're standing up and we're speaking and we're loud and we're getting louder and activists are in motion. Um, but yet they really have their ducks lined up in a row and they are just, they're really, I'm, I, I'm unfortunately impressed by, um, you know, everything that, that they, it, it's taken generations to put this all together and it's hitting us now. Now, if we as individual people do not act and stand up, we are going to get hit and it's just, we're going to have to live with it, you know, and it's going to be like, um, you've got to learn how to grow your own food in order to survive. It's going to get to that motto if we keep heading in this unsustainable direction. Well, they, they call it different things now, community gardens, urban gardening, and back in World War II, talk to your parents, grandparents, <laughs> great-grandparents, there's a thing called Victory Gardens. It was a TV show on PBS. Sure. I think it's still around. The little Victory Garden was an effort to grow your own food so that you would support the war effort and the big farms would supply the troops right. overseas. And so everybody had a farm. Everybody recycled. We did all these things not that long ago. I mean, we're talking, you know, my mother was a child of the Depression, and they did a lot of things back then um, that once we get into the consumerism of the post-war era, things just kind of, we forgot about all that. It was a lot living again, living through chemicals, and uh, we're sort of undoing that. The problem with that is you've got huge populations in China and India that are now struggling to feed their populations, and it's, they're being tempted. So is this moving, movement of uh, sort of organic of organics and non-GMO catching on in Asia at all? Or is it just mainly Europe, the United States, Canada? Uh, I think there are 60 some odd countries that have banned GMOs. Not the United States. Not the United States and not Canada. Those are the okay. two I'm really pushing for. Okay. Um, but considering Monsanto's here, I've heard uh, that they're headed to Switzerland. Um, uh, to have a base because then they don't have to pay taxes here. Unbelievable. 
Um, so it really comes down to we've got to eat like our life depends on it because it does. You know, um, we've got to not continue to purchase at Stop and Shop a, a box of cereal that our money then is going to go to Monsanto and you're going to build them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really about, it's, it's just a shifting habit. It's real, to me it's kind of easy, it's a no-brainer because mm -hmm. I don't want to build something I don't believe in, right. you know. Um, but as far as what's going on around the world, yeah, there's a lot of world starvation going on. So, so we have these fields that are genetically modified, right? We've got these fields of corn that we need to have because they say GMOs are, we can produce more and less space with less fertilizer, with less, 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 you know, and it's going to be more um, abundance to mm -hmm. feed yeah, those that need yield. You're going to get more yield out of the GMO crop. It's a crock of shit. Okay, so this happened 30 years ago, why GMOs were allowed in the first place, which is 1989. GMOs were, you know, granted in the United States, 1992. No more labels. You didn't need to label the GMOs on your food. So how is this going? 30, it's been 30 some odd years, right? Mm -hmm. How has the world starvation gone away? Is it shit, you know? No, we have no word about it. What we're learning is these crops, these fields of corn are not able to, um, um, let's have us uh, regrow again and again and again because there isn't enough food in the soil. So you're not having the microorganisms, you're not having worms, they're all dead. Um, because of the herbicides they spray on these fields. So it's unsustainable. That's why GMO crops are unsustainable. Organic fields, on the other hand, are sustainable. So organic will end up, you know, kind of winning and feeding the world population. Um, what we have to do is figure out how to, you know, put back to these soils more microorganisms and worms, but it's going to take years to have living things get back in these dead soils. Well, this is again. just sort of a, if you look at it from a mass balance, right, that you keep, or a bank account approach, right, if you keep withdrawing, 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 eventually there's nothing there. And if you never put anything in, obviously there's a yeah. finite amount. And I always wondered, well, how does the soil continue to put in all that energy and nutrients into a little seed to make it this giant, you know, 8, 10, 12 foot tall stalk with years of corn. Where, where's it come from? It's not magic. I mean, it's pulling something from the soil, but where does the soil get it from? I mean, at some point you've withdrawn and it's the leftover parts of the plant, right? And then there's, it's pulling stuff from the atmosphere and also you got to let the fields. One teaspoon, yeah. one teaspoon of soil has more living organisms in it than anything else. There is so much life in that one teaspoon of soil. As long as it is happy and it keeps living, it's going to keep reproducing and it's going to keep pooping. And that poop is mm -hmm. what's going to feed the next yield. Right. So I don't actually feed plants. I'm an organic land provider and I don't feed plants. I feed soil. I have a completely different outlook on things. Um, that way I am able to create sustainable landscapes. So I guess I work with natives, but you can throw in stuff like hydrangea that's not from here and it can still live here without having to be, you know, on irrigation twice a week or even two hours a day or whatever situation it is. Um, it's the microorganisms in the soil. They are going to be feeding your plants. So I create, um, you know, it's like a cornucopia of food for them. I make sure they're happy. There's lots of worms going. It's that vermiculture, worm castings, that will feed your plants, your lawns, your perennials, your bushes, your trees, everything terracycle. growing. Terracycle. You've heard of Terracycle? Yeah, Terracycle is a company that basically makes uh, worm poop tea. And they mm -hmm. put it in used soda bottles and put their label on it. And they, they basically have... So and it's, it's really a hot commodity. That's called compost tea compost. applications. There you go. And you can make it yourself. It's real easy. You get a bin, you put some water in it, you put in an aerator. You need a pump mm -hmm. to keep it aerated. For 24 or 48 hours, you put in some molasses and you put in some anything, bat guana. You want worm 
castings, you want, you know, fish emulsion, something real and pure, and that turns into this really nice dark sauce. It's so good. And yeah, you can apply that to your land once a year, twice a year if you want, and that is actual food. That's not man-made synthetic fertilizer that might have a bag that says organic on it, six or eight step program, blah, blah, blah. And after a couple of years, so what I do is I say, get your land off drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and I switch people from conventional to non-toxic on the properties. And if you are you know, reliant on a Scots Lawns kind of a situation, it might take four or five years, mm -hmm. and then your land is sustainable, but it only takes four or five years, and your land will be able to sustain itself. What does that mean? You're not paying every year for six or eight step program anymore your land can feed itself. And for those that are already non-toxic but not feeding properly, that only takes a couple of years, maybe two, maybe three. It really is just gonna depend. And we can tell, we can be able to monitor the situation and let you know and shift accordingly, a little more, a little less. I got the town of Provincetown to go completely non-toxic on their seven town properties, their library, wow. yeah, their soccer fields. Kids play on them all the time, they're totally non-toxic, no has to worry about it. I just cut cold turkey. And, and you're putting compost tea down? Compost tea applications. And so it's the town's compost pile and you had them? Oh, no. No, okay. No, it's a, it's like a, it's a formula, like any sort of okay. recipe. You have a cake, you gotta follow the right. recipe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's gonna depend on what the pH level of the soil is existing and what plant sources are existing to know what recipe to make for that area. And we wean your property off of it. So mm -hmm. you're not dependent on, you know, us. It's called sustainable. That's what sustainable is. You, know, you can call me in a year and say, hi, how's it going? Sure, but you don't need to. <laughs> so this is, this can happen on sand. I mean, I love this, you know. I've been doing this for 23 years and it, it works. I was just in the hydrangea tour yesterday and tomorrow by chance, the Cape mm -hmm. Cod hydrangea tour. Thank you, I'm very proud and honored to be part of this. And um, how neat am I able to say, absolutely everything in this place is non-toxic and people's eyes, that grass is green. I'm like, yeah, sure. I got it. I have koi, I have a fish pond, and so sometimes, you know, you just throw a little water in your lawn, to, you know, the nitrogen from the fish, from the koi. Boom, ta-da, circles of life. I'm constantly trying to think about the circles of life. Right. You know, and, and we can do this. It's, not, it's less expensive, uh, especially in the long run. And, um, and it's, it's, to me, it's a no-brainer. This is easy. maybe going to freak out some of you at home, uh, what I'm about to say. But you probably know where I'm going with this. But in Europe, in Scandinavia, because nitrogen is a huge issue on the Cape right now, we're talking about with yes. our embayments in the septic systems, right? Well, they collect urine in Scandinavia, and the urea is the form of nitrogen that we excrete, and they actually collect it, and then they make a fertilizer out of it. They sanitize it and you know, all of that. And they recycle it, and up in Vermont, they're, they're, doing, they're looking at doing this, and they showed the, you know, they did an experiment with one part of the field with that, and the other one without it, and this is greener than that. So I'm not saying, you know, go pee in your lawn or anything like that, but it's just interesting that it, it, it brings it back to you personally that we've been so disconnected from everything that, you know, basically our ancestors, not that long, even our grandparents, were much more connected to their food, their neighbors, you know, on and on and on. We've been disconnected from all of that. Uh, everything's prepackaged, um, highly processed. That leads to a whole bunch of other health issues, which would yeah. be another whole show. Um, and then it cycles through very quickly. And I'm interested that when do you see that the uh, bill will be due on these lands that have gone all GMO and all heavily, uh, when are they going to find out when they go, oh, yeah, we've really depleted the soil so badly that now the budget for inputs far exceeds if we'd gone organic, it, accounting for some of the crop loss because of pests, you know, um, pests or whatever. Well, isn't that a trick been... question? Because unfortunately, those that are um, creating genetically modified organisms, Monsanto, <clears throat> um, are making money. And they want to continue to make money. And they know that they're doing harm while making money. 
And so when are they going to stop making money to do good? We don't know if it's in their makeup because they did Agent Orange and PCBs and RBGH and there's so many. I mean, I can list them. Saccharin, we got the atom bomb, nuclear weapons, DDT, dioxin, um, petroleum-based fertilizers. Roundup, of course, glyphosate, the active ingredient that's actually killing male sperm cells. Sorry, guys, but it's true. Don't touch Roundup and don't even get a, you know close to it. It's it's not not healthy. Aspartame, um, GMOs, and Agent Orange all given to us by Monsanto. So this has been happening since 19 no I'm sorry 1899. Monsanto uh, company was created. So I just don't know as if it's going to be like hey when are they going to quit? But the I'm talking about the farmers that oh, use oh. this stuff. So when do they oh. when do they say that? Wait a minute. I was told this is going to increase my yield. They're already shifting over. Okay, so, so it's, it's obvious to farmers they're figuring it out. because what happens is they have to sign a waiver um, by Monsanto to purchase the genetically modified seeds, GMO seeds. Um, and what are GMO seeds? They're genetically modified. Well, what does that mean? That means that in our world, it's dead food. Um, you can use it once and you grow your corn and you take the seed from the corn and you plant it in the ground and it does not regrow. It's dead. There's no nutritional value, we believe. It doesn't, it's just, it's just no vitality, it's dead food. Um, and so you have to go back to Monsanto to purchase more seeds. So it's about money. Again, year after year after year, the farmers aren't making much on their yield and they're then having to spend the money on the seeds the next year. It's, it's broken the circle of life. Um, so they're, so they're learning, out. yeah, and they're going back to being organic. They're seeing their yields stronger through droughts, et cetera, et cetera. They're seeing, um, you know, their actual fields, you know, are not just straight monocrops. Weeds are growing back, um, you know, because they're not spraying. And it, it's this, it's slowly catching on. It's going to take time. I wanted to list, and, and we're going to show this on the screen, uh, there's about... 12 different major crops that are genetically modified. They show up in different ways. Some of these are pretty much in everything that is in processed food. We're looking at soy, cotton seed, corn, canola oil, papaya, alfalfa, sugar beets, milk through RBGH, recombinant bovine growth hormone, right? Is that what that is? Yes. And uh, aspartame, which is a sweetener, uh, equal NutraSweet. Uh, Two types of squash, zucchini and yellow, and then soon to be approved, apparently, uh, Arctic uh, variety of apples, apples and a whole bunch of different potatoes. potatoes. So potatoes just came out, unfortunately. They're out now. So French fries are going to be genetically modified. They're already out. The apples will be out next year, we believe. So, you know, this fall they're going to grow for next year. Uh, but the potato potatoes are already <coughs> out there. Uh, there's only 12 things that are genetically modified. That's it. I mean, I look at it that way. Could be more, but is right it? now that's it. The, the problem is, is that they're in so many more things than 12 things. Right. So you really got to be aware of what you're purchasing and reading if it says sugar on it. If it doesn't say it's organic sugar, it's going to be genetically modified. And why is this so scary? What's the big deal? It's modified genetically. You're going to eat that food. It's affecting you and your genetics. We don't know how to process this. This is unnatural. This is made in a lab, in a petri dish, in a in a sterile environment, um, let out in in the world, and it's trial and error. We are guinea pigs. We are. There's no doubt about it. Our next generation is completely hindered in health aspects and so many things. If your children are unhealthy, if they've got asthma, I mean, there's such a list of things that they, you know, have, you know, allergies to foods. You shouldn't be allergic to food. <laughs> you yeah, should be able a, to eat This is a very strange food. thing that I never heard growing up, and I'm sure a lot of us in the audience. Do you ever remember anybody having a problem with peanuts in, yeah, yeah. in the school? Sure. And all of a sudden, in the last 15 years, now there's an epidemic of kids dying. You know, my niece, she said at the dinner table when she was a young girl, my tongue itches when we're eating chicken. And all of a sudden, 
we figured out when she went to anaphylaxis in high school jogging that she was allergic to poultry. Now, I know that there's some things that have been around for a long time, but the peanut one seems relatively new. How did that all of a sudden, this, this huge tidal wave of, of kids being allergic to peanut, and not, not just a mildly, I mean like deadly allergic. Yeah. It just seems uh, bizarre. There's a non-GMO shopping guide that you were so kind to, to give out, and that's uh, non-gmoshoppingguide.com. And this lists all what types of um, where GMOs are or brands that don't have GMOs or maybe both. Yep, we got pet products in here, snack foods, soups, sauces, fruits, vegetables, dairy, condiments, body care. I mean, it's a really good, cute little thing that's very helpful to have in your pocketbook when you're purchasing things. Um, do this for children. If you're not going to do this for yourselves, do this for the next generation and allow them to be able to have an immune system that's strong. You know, the reason why we're allergic to peanuts and wheat is the big one now, um, you know, celiac oh, yeah, gluten, disease, yeah, the yeah. gluten and wheat, is our immune systems are knocked down. You know, we've got to build them back up. It's not hard to do. The best thing to do if you do have a child that's, you know, got issues, whatever they may be, um, is to, for two weeks, just quit all GMOs. Eat an organic diet for two weeks straight. That's it and to see how they gain ground. You know, they're gonna have energy. It'll just be different for everybody. So I can't, you know, I'm not gonna be able to state exactly everything, but, but just be aware, be conscious, see what's going on um, and try things, trial and error, you know? We've gotta take control of this situation because our government is not mm -hmm. taking care of us. They're taking care of themselves. They are so, you know, we, you know, six corporations own all of the media. So what we see on TV, ketchup and, you know, this and that. Any advertisement on television is not going to be healthy for you. So keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the Internet is uh, obviously like any tool. There's good and there's bad and you have to be discerning. But there's a lot of information out there that, that is bypassing uh, normal channels. And there's YouTube channels. You can have your own podcast. I mean, there's sure. so many... Different words, local community access television. Yay. Yay. Thank you to Born Community TV and to LCTV down the LCTV. Cape and all the Shout local. Out. And I encourage any of you out there watching to come take the course and see Elaine and Jen here and, and support your local community television. So this, I've been doing this for 25 years. Oh, wow. And uh, not this show. This show is, you know, coming up on 18 years. But still just hmm. working in this studio doing things. It's a lot of fun, folks. But this is another way to get interesting things out there. You never know who's out there watching, I know. right? And this is now living on in the internet in different ways, and it can be what they call bicycle down other stations. And you've shown yeah. this down um, down Cape as well. So. Yeah, um, bringing awareness to people's homes is where we're at with social media. It is amazing. It's instant now. Yeah. You know, we don't have to wait till five o'clock to hear the news. We can go on Facebook. Please Facebook friend me, anybody. Laura Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y. I post things about food, you know, simple things. that was just like um, put bananas and coconut and vanilla together and have some ice cream. I was like, oh my gosh, it's so simple, you know? And, and then you can buy the products yourselves and, and the foods that you want, the quality you want, and make it so easy. So I love playing around with this every well, day. Uh, I don't want to get too much more into the show uh, without having you talk a little bit about okay. what you brought and why. Okay, sounds and, good. And uh, you get some natural... Um, so I wanted memory. to start off maybe with the outside. I, I really, again, want to stress that whatever we um, bring home, whatever we purchase, is going to matter to our aquifer in time. You okay. know, we are making an impact on our own natural resources here. So become as non-toxic as possible, recycle every single day 100%, and then you're gonna do your part um, in living here, I believe. I don't think it's hard, it's just setting up a system. So if we did exterior things first, there are organic options at like our local garden centers, Agway and you know Ace Hardware stores and stuff like that, and there's many options. This is a holly tone, there's a plant tone, a garden tone, a rose tone, so it's specific to needs you know please you know purchase things again that are just more gentle on our environment that still work and they're not costly i mean this is five bucks right. and it goes a long way 
Um, and so then interior wise, we have lots of different things. So thinking about like our own bodies, like what we put on ourselves, you know, we've got our skin, our hair, our toothpaste, you know, there's, there's companies that are good, there's companies that are borderline, this is a borderline, this is a good, you know, I don't wanna, you know, play that game right now. You've gotta do your own research and realize that there are, you know, companies that are top in the world for sunscreen and they're available locally like we're so lucky we're so fortunate because sunscreen is really we're getting more cancer from sunscreen than sun itself they say um, and you know again soaps I really think you know every day every sink in your house dishes you know soaps are, are used often and a lot why not have something that's not going to kill the worms when it goes down your sinks it goes outside or the fish if it goes further you know a lot of these things persist in soils and live longer than than we realize um, again we don't the testing is just so vague air you know what our air quality in our house we can change that if they've got moldy situations and stuff you can do that non-toxically um, laundry detergents fabric softener is the worst <laughs> you know plug in things in your wall to get your house to smell like vanilla terrible mm -hmm. you know get some cinnamon put it in a pot boil it you know there's just simpler remedies and do you, you know you can figure this stuff out for yourself um, and bug spray is a fun one i wanted to play with you on that can right. we can yeah. we make a bug yeah, make, spray why don't you show us what you got to have okay to make a so bug spray. so just get yourself a little container and label it of course i i label per color and i know what's what it's going to be i've got a couple different ones one's for fleas and ticks for animals um that's a quick one that's you know just taking some water and so anything citrus so um, you want to mix in um, um, these essential oils, so a tea tree and a citrus. So you could do an orange citrus, you could do a lemon citrus, you could do a vine, you know, whatever you can get your hands on. It's about a citrus with pets, and you want to apply it a couple different times, of course, away from all their, you know, eyes and ears and stuff like that. So you um, uh, want to just take some water in a container that's labeled, and thank you. We're going to make some bug spray, so I would like to use peppermint mm -hmm. um, because that's like a natural deterrent, and you put in like just, just 20 drops. You kind of sit there and... These call. are essential oils, which are they're very concentrated. Is that what that means? Absolutely. So this is taking the essence of the plant itself, um, like Bach flower essences. Mm -hmm. So you take the plant and you, um, you can boil it down. There's several different ways you can do it. Not quite done yet. Okay. We're actually going to add a citrus because we want to deter. This is going to deter mosquitoes. Okay. Um, and I keep this in my truck at all times because you never know if you're at a ball field or if you're at the beach or, of course, me at a job. You know, one campus will have natural deterrents, and I'll talk to you about that next, and others won't. And to be prepared is the best thing, because then you're not having welds all over your legs and arms. And <laughs> the fun things look forward to, ooh, I can smell that. But I did a lemongrass. Um, and the other fun thing to do is to think about um, growing things. So you have a patio outside, you have a deck. Most people do stuff outdoors, their own houses. If you plant plants, that are the peppermints, the lemongrass, um, you know, anything citrus, the citrus geraniums right here, citronella geraniums. Um, these things you put around your deck area or where you're going to be. The trick oh, is, is to like go smell. like this. Mm -hmm. The trick is to get the essence, the oils. And the bugs are like, nope, okay, that's too much. It's too powerful. I'm gone. That's it. it you just, can put it on yourself. You know, wow. you can put it on your really? clothes. Can you smell that at home? <laughs> I can. Or you take it with you, and then you just have a little spray. And I just, I just, I don't know. I go crazy with this stuff. I love it. I think it's excellent. And so it's, that was just a little citrus essence and yep. uh, peppermint. Yeah. Purchase yourself a bottle. Twenty drops. This goes a long way. You look at the bottle, and it's ten bucks. It's a little expensive, but mm. trust me, it's a lot cheaper than buying bug spray, bug spray, bug spray all the time. You can make your own, and you can 
do your own, you can do Smells 25. Great, yeah. yeah, you can do 25 drops. You can make it stronger if, you, if you've got the green heads or things like that. So think about your pets, think about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, make your own contraptions, you know, make your own. It's, it's just the way we've got to think about things. Well, a couple other things I uh, wanted to talk about. You talked about plants. Uh, for those that have a little yard and want to en en encourage beneficial critters to come around, um, we, we have some shots we're going to show uh, later on, but it was kind of cool. I, you know, Laura said, what do you think this is a home for? And I had no idea. I, I th oh. thought it might be yeah. you know, a ventilation uh, for the back of an owl uh, cage, but I have no idea what that is. That, that apparently is Anybody a, know what this is? Think, what do you think at home? <laughs> no? Anybody guess? Okay, think, uh, we're stumped. What is it? It's a butterfly house. So the more we can think about our native and natural pollinators and give them places to uh, be happy, to live, to survive, uh, it's better for us. They pollinate the food we eat. We need our native pollinators. You know, without this connection to our food source, um, we're given five years to live. And so, so they figure out that this is for them. This is for <laughs> the butterflies. That's pretty cool. And this is for our natural Mosquito killers. Let me use that word. What do you think this is? This is a bat house. And so you put this on your south facing, you know, up high on your own building, your own home, and just set it up for them. They will find it, they will come, and you're going to have less amount of mosquitoes in your property. Um, they well, come in the night, and, you know, fish also eat mosquitoes. and. Um, so, and the plants will keep mosquitoes away. And then there's also local companies that are set up that'll come to your house for a little amount of money and take the rosemary essential oils in a backpack sprayer and go around the base of your home, outside, around your porch and your patio. They're good for weddings, they're good for parties, and they're good just for, you know, once every three weeks to kill the eggs of the unwanted. Um, and it's not harmful to bees and bats and butterflies. So these companies are out here. Feel free to contact me on Facebook or um, contact Littlefield Landscapes at um, gmail.com or see my website at littlefieldlandscapes.com and just ask me, you know, if you have questions about these local companies that are already set up because they work, they're great. I rely on them quite often and all my clients are happy. It's simple, it's easy, it's cheap, and it's doable. So no more pesticides needed, <laughs> no more herbicides needed. We can make our own remedies. Oh, real quick, what's the greatest uh, herbicide remedy for Roundup? Vinegar, Excellent. straight up. Wow. Straight up, just put it in. You got another container, put it in straight up and hit those weeds like four o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> um, on the, in your driveway and your walkways and or whatever. And the, they, they, you're not feeding them water, you're feeding yeah. them vinegar. They're Vin gonna choke vinegar does a lot of, uh, has a lot of home remedies. Uh, I found of course. You Heloise hints and, and well, this is, I was gonna ask you this earlier. Are weeds bad? Because we, we have this obsession that our gardens have to look a certain way, uh, that between the crops in uh, fields, you have to have them perfectly manicured. And my question is, aren't some of those pulling, you know, if you leave them alone, they're pulling nitrogen in from the atmosphere and then they're, they're re feeding the soils, right? So are weeds bad? Can, we, can they coexist with the crops that we want? A uh, weed is bad when it's invasive. Okay. In my world, a plantain mixed with a perennial, not so bad. No, because it's helping. You know, it's it's helping feed the plants around it. They're called companions. They're companions with each other. You pull out all the companions and the plants sitting there by itself. I mean, it's, you know, that's not helpful. And everything that nature has given us is a benefit. You know, so a lot of weeds are food. Like sorrel tastes like lemons. It's great. I put it in salads all the time. I go to a client's house and I say, weed it all out. And I'm like, I'm putting it in my cooler. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is interesting because, you know, I, I, now let's, let's just say, you know, high end home, okay, that's one thing. But I'm wondering, are the organic farmers, they're obviously, they know these things, they're figuring them out. So they're planting or encouraging certain companion crops. One's the primary crop they're making money, the other is replenishing and helping support. So they're not looking for the perfectly groomed 
fields, I would imagine. They're, it's kind of like the, the idea that in France they started a movement because we waste a lot of food in this country, huge amounts mm -hmm. of food, and that has a whole bunch of other issues. And uh, the town is going to try to help out with that, with um, capturing what doesn't uh, get uh, diverted to uh, food pantries and such and making energy out of it. But the idea that you have to have the – my brother was a farmer, and he would go in the 70s, and if the corn didn't look exactly perfect or – uh, the tomatoes had a spot on them. They were like, oh, yeah, we don't want those because they don't look perfect. We had this, this fantasy of what it's supposed to look like. So they had a campaign called Ugly Food and Fruits and Vegetables. And then they discounted them, and, but, and they sold them. And people were buying them. And they go, wait a minute, this is the same as that over there, but it's just got a little weird shape to it so I can get 10% off. And so it's catching on a little bit because now the farmers don't have to throw it away. They were growing it, okay. and, th and they couldn't sell it, and they were throwing it away. I mean, just think about the waste. It's just I heartbreaking, know. tragic. Uh, and that comes in from the border. Uh, we have a few minutes left here. I wanted to also, t because you are an apiary, why don't you tell us what that is? And I, there was a front-page article in the Cape Cod Times today about, about that. So why don't you... Fill us in a little bit about that whole issue, what's going on, why it's a concern, and what's the latest. So our Cape. honeybees. Honeybees are not in our food chain, um, but they are the connection to the food that we eat. So without honeybees, we're not going to have enough food. They're the most aggressive pollinators on Earth. There are other pollinators, uh, just, you know, not as aggressive. You know, I see some as lazy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we need to do is keep our honeybees alive, and the best thing that we can do is to plant anything that flowers. Plant anything that flowers, or you know, plant some cilantro and eat it for a while, and then let it flower. You know, um, that uh, ability to keep them alive will keep us alive in return. Uh, unfortunately, there are a couple of um, masterminds, let's say, that are putting together. Uh, MIT and Harvard have created the Robo Bee and the Mobo Bee, Mo, Mo Bee, excuse me, and they're mobile bees. And so they say, oh, no, no, it's okay. The native bees, they can all, they can die. The honey bees, they can, you know, we, we will have the answer when and if they do. Let's put it that way. And it's just a shame because we don't really know, you know, that's not the direction we want to go in. I'd rather these big places pay attention to our honeybees and keep them alive instead. But the chemical companies are not slowing down. The EPA is allowing Enlist Duo, which is 2,4-D now with glyphosate, which is twice the power. And, and we're continuing to go forward to add more waste to our planet. And the, but the, and the, the issue... bees are, you know, it's a perfect um, storm. They're for threatened. Them. Absolutely. We're losing the colonies is for, what's going on. Yeah, okay. So colony collapse disorder is, you know, uh, the death of the honeybees. Every winter they're, you know, lessening by half if not more worldwide. Honeybees are uh, the canaries in the coal mine telling us that this planet and their air and their water and their food source, it's too much for them. The other corollary species that a friend of mine I was telling you is involved in researching about it are bats. And bats, they... they keep the insect population in control and we're losing millions of bats to a fungus and they think it might be stress related to again all the all of the impacts that we have it lessens your immune system so, again and, and people say well what do i care about a bunch of bees and bats well we think we're disconnected because we can go down the stop you know stop and shop or whatever and buy whatever we need as long as they're open well you know we, we, we've forgotten that all that comes from somewhere yeah and it all goes somewhere. And the latest is the monarch butterflies. I mean, their oh population boy. is, uh, I mean, it's the beginning of the end for them. And it's simply because of the chemical impact that's on this planet right now. And so uh, not building these large corporations, again, I'll stress it, is going to make a difference. Well, we've Each got one of us matters. a population projection of 9 billion by 2050. So hopefully worldwide. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit more. We have about a minute left. I want to make sure we, we give the website again, if you could give us this one. For sure. Part. I've created an organization called pocacapecod.org. That's P-O-C-C-A, Protect Our Cape Cod Aquifer. And I'm the proud owner of Littlefield Landscapes, and uh, that's littlefieldlandscapes.com. And I'm Laura Kelly. And Thank I'm sure there's plenty me. of information. I think the state supports organic farming, so if you go to the states with mass.gov, you could probably find about local organic farms. I know they're really pushing that uh, and learn a little bit more about that. 
Well, again, another hour has flown by. And I'm sure we could talk for two more hours, but I uh, wanted to thank you for watching out there and think about how your lifestyle affects all of this and what you're putting in your body. And you know, I, I'm thinking about some things I may want to change in my life too. So I hope you enjoyed and have a great summer. Thanks for watching.